Hello, welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. This time we're taking a look at Nintendo Power number 8 for September and October of 1989. This time we actually have some games to review, so let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is DuckTales, and the cover has a nice mix of some of Disney's art for the character, combined with some of the diorama work that is becoming the signature style for Nintendo Power's covers. In the letters column, we get another story about the survivability of the NES. A woman in Fargo accidentally drove over her kid's NES with an 84 Cadillac, but it still works! Next up is the feature article for the first major Capcom Disney game, DuckTales. The article gives gameplay notes, like using Launchpad to grind for gold, as well as giving maps of the stages for the Amazon, Transylvania, and the African Mines, along with locations for... Uh, the next few levels, strategies for those locations, and strategies for most of the boss fights. From a gameplay standpoint, Capcom's DuckTales is basically the point where Disney licensed games went from crap, like Mickey Mouse Capade, to some of the best platformers on any console that weren't from a first party. The con controls were cleverly designed while still being fairly intuitive, and the music in the game is absolutely fantastic. The levels have a great deal of visual style and flair, with a design that rewards exploration. The game's premise even fits in nicely with the Carl Barks and Don Rosa comics. Uncle Scrooge wants to increase his wealth, and rather than simply settling for gaining it through business dealing, he goes on elaborate adventures to get the cash. Actually, Scrooge McDuck is kind of like player characters in Dungeons & Dragons in this respect. In fact, this is probably why when the um, campaign setting of Glorantha was created for RuneQuest, there is a race of well, anthropomorphic ducks, a la Scrooge McDuck or Donald in the game. This issue moves us more into the proper strategy guide for Dragon Warrior, with advice on how to get started and how to grind effectively for levels 1 to 5. However, there is an even bigger strategy guide for the game next issue, so I'm going to save the full review for then. We also have an article for Nintendo's wireless multi-tap device, the NES Satellite, along with a rundown of upcoming games that support multi-tap, but this isn't actually a feature article for any of these individual games, so I'll save that for later. Moving on with the game reviews, though, we have a look at the game Hoops, which is a street basketball game. As I mentioned under my review of Double Dribble, I hate basketball video games. They are basically unnecessary. I generally can do better playing the game in like basketball in real life than I can in the game itself, so it feels like kind of a waste of time, unless you really don't have a basketball hoop available near you and someone to play with. There isn't really a good reason for this. I, I just don't feel like I have the same sense of control and responsiveness when playing a basketball video game than I do when I actually play it in real life. It feels like the game is getting in the way of playing well. And this game magnifies all those problems by having it be one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two, Thus, consequently, you're going up against an AI-controlled opponent who is better at this than you are, can shoot shots more accurately than you can, and who you can't pass around unless you're doing um, a two-player game. Or a, So it's just... Just skip this game. It's not worth it. In Council's Corner, we have a question about where you can find the hammer in Zelda 2. We also have one more article on Fester's Quest, which I've already reviewed, which is more in-depth than the last article in the game, but still, I'm not reviewing this again. Next featured game, which we will be reviewing, though, is Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which has a unfortunately unlabeled map with some notes on how to get started, but without those needed locations being labeled on the map. However, from a gameplay standpoint, this is kind of understandable, because all of the items you need to complete this game and progress in this game are, well randomly located at the start of each game. So, I could kind of understand why the map is unlabeled. And, as is, this game is boring. There are very few games which I can describe as being a potent sleep aid. This is one of them. It's supposed to be a sort of a hybrid action game and adventure game, where you play Eddie Valiant trying to find the pieces of Markman Acme's will. The problem is, is everything in the game is randomly generated. As I mentioned earlier, which means that Consequently, 
a lot of the things which make adventure games work, like dialogue with characters that point you in the right direction, um, logically designed puzzles, aren't there. Instead, it's just a rant, general wandering around doing fest questy stuff um, to proceed in the game. Um, I mean, talking to characters is is useless because all they can really tell you is, is there anything in this building that you can find? Uh, it doesn't help you, well, go, doesn't help you find what you need. It doesn't say, have people saying, oh, go to building X to find this item that doesn't come up in the game. It's just wandering around and eventually getting killed and getting frustrated. To be fair, I should expect this. This is a title published by LJN. They, well, they have a reputation as being the producer of the Rainbow of Crap. Yet, this is also a game developed by Rare, and thus far, a lot of LJN games have been developed by Rare. In fact, considering the sheer number of titles being published by Rare, on the one hand, this, should be su- this shouldn't be surprising. They're putting out a lot of titles for the NES. They're developing a lot of stuff. Things sh- will slip through the cracks, yet Rare, during the well, time they were developing games for Nintendo systems, they're kind of sainted. Um, now, I guess the big thing here is, I guess it kind of, this is an eye-opener here. Rare, particularly after Donkey Kong Country came out, got a reputation of being Nintendo's sort of second-party Capcom. Putting out lots of high-quality titles for home console systems. Um, but in the NES generation, in the 8-bit generation, I guess one of the things I've learned a lot from doing this series is Rare is, as far as the NES is, NES is concerned, less like Capcom, more like Tosei or Micronix. In terms of their developer, which did a lot of work for hire, and ultimately this led to a lot of stuff that would be probably be classified as Kusoge by Japanese gamers. And actually, really thinking about this, I'd love it if somebody wrote a book about the corporate culture of Rare during the late 80s, around the time that games like, well, this came out. Um, because we have such a weird mix of great titles like RC Pro-Am and Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Um, I'd love to see what was going on behind the scenes. I'd love to hear a description of what was going on. Something like the books A Soul of a New Machine, which, if you haven't read my prose review of it earlier, or text review earlier, is a review, is a book about the development of a um, microcomputer. And all the process going through the design of the system and how they were, rec- and how the company recruits people and that sort of thing. And since we're here, we're dealing with, well, the designing games, a task which requires not only enthusiasm for technology, but also great creativity and imagination, I'd be interested to see what's going on behind the scenes that led to, on the one hand, again, great stuff like RC Pro-Am, but on the other hand, utter crap like this, and the other LJN games that were developed by Rare. Um, so, if somebody has the inside scoop, please write that. I'd love to read it. Moving on. Well, the Game Boy is out, and that means we have a feature article on the system and its big launch title, Tetris. And since I'm reviewing every featured game in Nintendo Power Magazine, well, let's get on with the gameplay. Except that this is Tetris, and there really isn't much to say here. Tetris is Tetris. It plays exactly like the way you're used to playing Tetris, with like the one distinct difference that the Game Boy version of the game doesn't allow for T-spins, so if you're accustomed to using T-spins in your gameplay style, well, it won't help you. Though on the other hand, if you're trying to train yourself out of some bad habits uh, for a Tetris tournament, this might be a good way to do some training. We also get uh, some preview coverage for Willow from Capcom. We're getting a full feature on the game next issue, so I'll give it a proper review then. As it stands, the article basically shows that the game is a Zelda-style action RPG based loosely on the film. We also have a preview of another brawler from Technos, and one that's generally more favorably remembered than Rampage and Double Dragon, specifically River City Ransom. 
Sunsoft also has a side-scrolling action platformer coming out based on the first Tim Burton Batman film, complete with Tecmo-style cutscenes. Hopefully they don't reuse their Sunsoft weapon upgrade path, and also manage to minimize their sprite reuse, both things which they did in Fester's Quest. Nintendo now also has their own um, NFL-style football game, though not with the license for either the teams or the players. Um, and this game, as was mentioned in the NES Select article, has multi-tap support. This isn't the full feature, this is a preview, so I'm going to hold off until later and then review that game when we come to it. In the classified information column, we have one particular cheat that's of real interest, and that is the uh, password system for 1943 has been cracked, and we get a rundown of what the various portions of it work. This is kind of one of the things I like about password systems, is you can take them apart and see how they work and what things do what. So you can either cheese the game, or just, if you, well, lose your password or miswrite your password, you can kind of work from this to go, okay, I was here with this stuff at this point. I can basically clutch together a password to make up for whatever I lost. In Howard and Nestor, Nestor's taking on Mega Man 2. Or rather, he's taking on Dr. Wily with knowledge from Mega Man 2. Specifically, Wily has a new robot master, Howard, whose secret weapon is his bow tie. This time, Nestor manages to get one over on the robot through a couple of carefully applied logic bombs, leading to Howard waking up in a cold sweat. It was all a dream. In the video short section, we have a whole bunch of shoot 'em ups and one particularly notable strategy game. The first console installment of Koei's classic strategy game series, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which currently isn't getting released on consoles anymore in favor of the continually ongoing Dynasty Warriors series. In the top 30, The Guardian Legend and Super Mario Bros. 3 have entered the list. This is notable in particular since neither one has been featured in the magazine yet, and in the case of Super Mario Bros. 3, we haven't even seen gameplay stills. The Wizard isn't even out by the time this uh, issue hits newsstands, so it's not even a situation of people having seen gameplay footage either. This is just on name alone. Um, in the Pack Watch column, the semi-random dungeon crawler Tombs and Treasures is coming out, or sorry, semi-modern dungeon crawler Tombs and Treasures is coming out. In the NES Journal column, the Super Mario Bros. Super Show is getting a companion series on television with Captain N the Game Master, with the premise somewhat similar to the short fiction stories that, or the serialized fiction that ran earlier in the magazine that I skipped over because it was terrible. In the Celebrity Profile section, there's an article about Brian Robbins from Head of the Class. Robbins is currently moved away from acting and more into the territory of television production, including having worked on a as an executive producer on Smallville, though he certainly wasn't a showrunner. Before the end of the issue, we have a contest where the winner gets a trip to the set of RoboCop 2. And as I say for the record, I kind of find it somewhat hilarious the marketing of incredibly violent films for kids around this time between the Conan television series and the Rambo television series and so forth and so on. Though particularly noticeable and notable was is, is Robocop because aside from just the violence, there's the level of satire here which likely would have gone over a lot of kids' heads and thus they would miss out on part of what makes Robocop so good. Not just the action and the effects, but also the writing. So, we now come to my picks of the issue. On the two-player two player front, it's a no-brainer. Tetris. I mean, Hoops is okay, but it probably would be better with two-player. But honestly, if you can get enough people together to play one-on-one -on -one video game basketball, maybe you might as well just go out and play one-on-one -on -one real basketball. The saying. Again, it's not like freaking the full NBA games where you have a full team and it, there might be some logistics involved getting that number of people together. It's a game where you play pickup games. Saying. Uh, so, two-player front, absolutely Tetris. Whether you have two Game Boys and are hooking up together that way, or who knows, maybe there's a way to um, 
I don't know if you can do two player through the uh, Game Boy, uh, through the Super Game Boy, but if it's possible, try it that way. As for my single player pick, well, DuckTales. Great music, great gameplay, lots of fun. And heck, it's even getting a uh, remake, which they showed off some gameplay footage of it at E3. Looks kind of interesting. I'll have to see more. Hopefully it'll be a demo. And I'll definitely, once it comes out, see about giving it a shot. Next issue, finally be discussing Dragon Warrior, as the cover for that one boasts a 36-page insert. Good a time as any to give it the uh, full review. And I'll see you then. Mm -hmm.